Order. And the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Employment and Learning, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, in further education, uh, my department provides financial assistance to students through further education awards and hardship funds, which are administered respectively by the Western Education and Library Board and by each of the six colleges. Uh, over the last five years, there has been a net increase of approximately £800,000 in total amount available in the combined funds, with the budget set aside for FE awards rising by over £2 million. While the actual drawdown of resources in demand-led hardship fund may have decreased by just over 900,000, the actual spend on FE awards has increased by 1.5 million. The funds are advertised extensively and through a variety of media by both the board and the colleges. Further education awards are promoted on the Western Education Library Board's website and through a television advertising campaign which is run during May and June each year. In addition, each college promotes both funds through the following channels, prospectuses, websites, uh, prominently displayed posters and a variety of funding guidance literature, including flyers, mail drops and information in college diaries, which are provided to students. Funding advice is also provided at induction sessions. My department consults with the Western Education Library Board regarding the content of their advertising campaign. To ensure consistency across the colleges, my department provides good practice guidelines with regard to, pub to publicity of the hardship funds. Higher education support funds are administered and publicised by the higher education institutions and the colleges delivering higher education to help students experiencing financial hardship. My department provides the funding and copies of the conditions booklet to the, to the uh, universities and colleges. We also place information and the conditions booklet on the NI Direct and the Department for Employment and Learning websites. Again, I'll call Mr. McKinney for supplement. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And, uh, Minister, given the recent publicity and, and media attention on this, are you reviewing in any, to any extent the, the level of funds uh, uh, available? Well, thank the, the member for, for the question and um, I suppose for the opportunity to clarify that a lot of the media and commentary around this has been uh, very uninformed and has looked solely at the issue of a reduction in spend in hardship funds without actually appreciating that, appreciating that there's been a complementary increase in FE awards and indeed that the overall package um, has, has increased. That said, I, mean, I am happy to look at how we are uh, promoting uh, the, the schemes. Um, but in, in saying that, I would, I would maybe exercise some caution in that we have actually seen an increase in applications to the funds in, in recent years, uh, which indicates that the message is getting out there. But where uh, further work can be done to better signpost and to streamline that and to make it more efficient and effective, of course, we're always open to learning lessons. And I'm more than happy that, that we will have uh, some internal discussions in that regard to see if we can do things uh, even better. I call Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, you did say you would look at the funding available. In the briefing you gave to the committee last Wednesday, you actually indicated there would be a 3.5 million reduction in student support provision across several demand-led programmes, and that included demand-led programmes that were means-tested as well. Can you give clarification to the House now? Are you going to look at increasing, or are you looking at the 3.5 million reduction that you told the committee last week? Well, I thank the, the Chair of the Committee for his question, and it's important that we draw a distinction between what is set in the budget and what is actually uh, spent. Uh, the key consideration in all of these issues is the, the actual spend, uh, which is increasing. In terms of the, the actual budget, and the, the Chair is referring to the indications I've given to the Committee regarding how we're going to manage the in-year cuts that have been asked of us uh, during this year, we have indicated that we are likely to see some underspends in some areas of, of student uh, support, and that includes the FE awards. So the, w we will have a budget allocated to that. We may not draw down all the money from that. That creates an underspend. Uh, rather than return that to the centre, we have the ability to offset some of the, the, the cuts uh, through that what would otherwise be an underspend. But that in no way, shape or form means that we are actually reducing uh, money from the front line. And, uh, this is a, a demand-led process, and where demand is there, it, it will be met. And if we happen to overshoot uh, what is now in a revised budget, uh, then we will look for other funds elsewhere uh, within the department to meet that demand. So there is a clear commitment from me that we will meet uh, the demand that comes our way. And I call Mr. Fran McCann. I thank the Minister for his answer. 
but can he advise the House whether he is approaching the forthcoming meeting with the NUS and the USA with an open mind to reconsider his decision to transfer money away from the Hardship Fund? Well, I always uh, approach um, every meeting uh, with, with, with an open mind. Um, but let me be clear, we have not taken a, a decision uh, to transfer money uh, out of hardship funds. They are a demand-led uh, initiative. And what we have done is we have um, redirected money into FE awards. Those are awards that are uh, allocated in advance uh, of the academic year. So in, the, in that circumstance, the student actually has the support at the, at the beginning of their studies rather than having to apply in a reactive way to hardship funds. Now, I would have thought uh, in all walks of life it is better to, to intervene early and give people the, the protection and certainty as opposed to leaving them uncertain. And I, I find it bizarre that people are saying that we should have to take money from elsewhere and go back to a policy of investing in the hardship funds when we have actually a better means uh, for providing uh, support, uh, support to students. And I have to say people are only looking at one aspect of a budget and uh, people are, need to be very careful of, of drawing conclusions without actually looking at the full picture. Thank you. And could I inform members before we move on that uh, questions 7 and 14 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr Tom Elliott. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the South West College is working closely with Fermanagh District Council with a view to being a partner in a proposed shared services project at the Western Health and Social Care Trust's former Urn Hospital site. The Fermanagh District Council is leading a development group who are seeking to create a public sector shared services hub on the site. The first stage of the plan is that the Council will purchase a site from the Health Trust when demolition work, contamination surveys and title issues have been resolved. The College is developing a draft business case which has, as its preferred option, a new build as a replacement for its Fairview campus. The next stage will see the College submitting a business case which includes a proposal for the purchase of part of the, of the site from the District Council for the redevelopment of a new College campus. The Department awaits firm proposals from the College in relation to the availability and viability of purchasing the site. This cannot be completed until the Western Health and Social Care Trust has completed the site transfer to Fermanagh District Council. Officials from my Department and the Strategic Investment Board continue to support the project. The Department of Environment Planning NI, has indicated that the redevelopment will be acceptable in principle and will meet planning policy, subject to the normal site-specific planning and environmental criteria. No funding commitment can be made until the business case has been approved by me and also by the Department of Finance and Personnel. Commissioner Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for, for that response. I'm just wondering um, how confident he is that uh, the, the progression will go on of the new college and what time frame would he put in that? Um, well, I thank the member uh, for his question. Uh, uh, yes, I am optimistic that this uh, will, will go ahead. Um, I appreciate that it perhaps has taken a little longer to come to fruition than maybe had originally been, been the case. And I think that reflects the, uh, the complexity of the, the outgoing uh, site uh, and the, the, the current use or the, the, the former use uh, that the site uh, was, was put to. Um, so that has brought some challenges with respect um, to, to demolition and the, the, the environmental aspects uh, around all of that. I would expect it to be in a position to receive and clear a business case uh, during uh, 2015. And uh, while there, there are other projects in terms of the FE estate uh, that we are keen to advance, uh, I am certainly uh, very minded to be uh, making a bid to the executive uh, with regard uh, to, to this particular project and appreciate uh, that the shared service site uh, in, in particular uh, provides uh, potential for synergies uh, across the public sector. And so there's a particular strong case uh, with respect to this project. Particular proposal. Well, Mr. Phil Flanagan. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can I take him back to the, the, the last point he made about the, the shared services site? Um, and, and I'm wondering, does he accept in principle that it makes sense um, to locate a college which has plans to become a rural university um, on the same site as a, a public library um, and the Jobs and Benefits Office? And if so, would he, would he be trying to work with other departments within the executive to make this proposal into a reality? Uh, well, I think the, the member can take considerable consolation that there, there is a, a lot of interest in this uh, uh, particular site uh, across a number of different departments and indeed in ministers. And I think the First Minister and Deputy First Minister uh, indeed visited uh, the location a, a number of months ago, uh, which is an indication of the, the collective interest uh, that, that there is in, in this regard. Uh, obviously, the more that uh, 
the site can be used, uh, then the better it will be in terms of building up different types of, of, of relationships. Uh, not every particular two agencies will, will have a natural partnership, uh, but there will be enough uh, to, to, make this, to make this viable. And in turn, that will have uh, further uh, multiplier effects in terms of the local economy, in terms of, of particularly of the service sector, uh, given the number of people who will, will be working in, in that facility. So there will be a wider benefit for the town of Inniskillen as well. I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I appreciate that the, the focus is on the, uh, the South West, but the Minister, I am sure, would agree with me that there are pressures right across Northern Ireland. Can the Minister assure this House that despite all the pressures he has, he can guarantee to this House that vocational education, which played an absolute blinder in providing education to people who perhaps missed out the first time round, are bestowed with equality and that the capital projects will not simply be put to the end of a queue and other greater priorities made. Well, I can certainly give the, the member an assurance that I am very keen to progress a wide range uh, of capital pro, uh, projects, including in terms of further education. And uh, I certainly believe that a, a modern uh, FE estate is integral to ensuring that we are investing in the skills agenda. And as the member, I'm sure, will agree, the FE sector is incredibly flexible and diverse and covers a, a, a wide range of, of interventions from essential skills uh, through to the provision of, of of higher education. That said, I, mean, I do have to put on record my, my concern around the, the, the current funding decisions that are, that are being taken. Um, and while vocational education is incredibly important to our economy, we have a situation where the budget of the Department of Education has been uh, given protection by the Executive, uh, but my uh, department has not. Now, that is not a plea for me saying that my department should be protected as well. It is rather a situation where uh, I think we have to re reflect that whenever decisions like that are taken, uh, certain inequities will be created in the system. And a, a particular one relates to what happens for those young people between 16 and 19. Those young people who are uh, at school uh, will benefit uh, from protection. Uh, those who are in further education or training programmes uh, will not. We ha have to be conscious that some 40 per cent of young people um, between 16 and 19 are, are in education and training outside of the school, of the school sector. And the, the socio-economic background of that cohort is different than, than the population as a whole. So that is something we, I think we all have to reflect upon in terms of uh, the future uh, ar around our budgets and ensure that what we do uh, is, is money that is well spent and also we are taking into account uh, equality considerations. Thank you. And Mr. Alec Easton isn't in his place, so I call Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question four, please. I've been active. I have been actively encouraging and facilitating the development of higher-level apprenticeships. Higher-level apprenticeships enable young people to benefit from working with important employers in Northern Ireland, as well as gaining a recognised qualification at level four or above. I am currently supporting a number of pilots. For example, in ICT, we have 15 apprentices employed by the McAvoy Group, Allstate and Core Systems undertaking training at South West College. In engineering, 15 apprentices working with Terex, uh, Cavergo and the Quinn Group are undertaking training uh, at South West College as well. Uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers has employed 18 apprentices in professional services, 14 in taxation and 4 in audit. In finance and accounting, recruitment is currently underway with expressions of interest received from a range of accountancy employers, uh, including uh, FPM Accountants, ASM uh, Haworth, uh, BHP Accountants Limited. The training will be provided by Belfast Metropolitan College and the Southern Regional College. In industrial, chemical and life sciences, recruitment is, is currently underway uh, through Norbrook Laboratories, uh, with training of around 14 apprentices through the Southern Regional College. But the, the, these are but a few examples with further pilots planned in engineering and aeronautical engineering with major employers, including Bombardier. A further exciting development that I have promoted is the extension of higher level apprenticeships to the public sector. In June, alongside the, the Regional Development Minister, Danny Kennedy, I announced a higher level apprenticeship for around 10 apprentices in civil engineering and proposals from the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service and the Police Service of Northern Ireland are also anticipated. We know that demand for skills at levels 3 to 8, that is A-level to doctorate, is set to increase significantly. And my vision through the apprenticeship strategy is that higher level apprenticeships will play a major role in meeting this demand. Well, Ms. Judith Cochran for a supplement. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for um, very positive information there. Can the Minister um, give us um, some further information um, as to what progress is being made to implement the new apprenticeship strategy? Okay, th thank the member uh, for uh, the, the questions. Um, as the House will know, uh, we uh, released our, our new apprenticeship strategy for Northern Ireland, uh, securing our success uh, in June of, of this year. And uh, this is certainly not something that's sitting on the shelf, if anything, very much the opposite. Uh, a lot of work has been conducted uh, already. Uh, we have an implementation plan that we are uh, working through. Uh, and over the coming weeks, uh, I will be chairing a number of, of meetings with employers uh, with a view to, to establishing the sector partnerships. Uh, this is a key means uh, of ensuring that we have buy-in from the, the stakeholders in particular industries, uh, and those groups will be used uh, to effectively plan uh, the rollout of apprenticeships uh, in, uh, in some current areas and indeed some, some new areas. I think one of the, the very encouraging things that we have seen is even in response to the fact that we were discussing a new strategy on apprenticeships, a lot of businesses and colleges began voting with their feet and coming up with new and innovative ideas. Uh, and uh, Indeed, our strategy has actually been moving to catch up with what has actually been happening uh, on the ground. So I believe that Northern Ireland has a, a very promising future in terms of apprenticeships, and they will become a very effective means of ensuring that employers are getting the, the right people for their uh, organisations in, in, in the future, and indeed that young people uh, will be skilled in areas that are highly relevant to, to the modern economy and will have much better prospects of uh, securing and, and sustaining jobs. I will call Mr Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And, Minister, I welcome very strongly your <coughs> response to Judith Cock on the day. But could I ask, in terms of, and I know how relevant and important it is in my own constituency, alongside the public sector bodies you are speaking to, is there any other sectors that you are encouraging <coughs> or motivating to try and bring them into these higher level apprenticeships? Yes, um, we are very keen uh, to work uh, with employers right across Northern Ireland, and that includes uh, within uh, the, the North West, and indeed, indeed there may well be potential for things to happen on, on a, on a sub-regional uh, uh, basis. Uh, discussions have been uh, taking place with a number uh, of employers uh, in, in the North West. We are not as stage yet to, 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 to publicise that, but the member will know um, indeed who are the, the main players in, 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 the, in the local economy. Um, I think it is also important to bear in mind that the, given the profile of employment in, in places such as Derry, that we do seek to develop uh, the public sector uh, as, as a means of, apprentice, of apprenticeships, and there will be areas of, of public sector employment that are highly relevant to this type of training. We are seeing that through a number of particular organisations where technical skills are, are relevant, um, expressing interest and having discussions with my officials. And, uh, I think that, that will uh, be a very lucrative uh, route uh, in, in, in the future months. I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I think we thank the Minister uh, for his answers and commend the work he has done on the apprentice strategy. Uh, does the Minister have any concerns about the implications of the lack of funding? that may impact on your strategy, considering the failure of Sinn Féin to agree on welfare reform? Um, well, I, I certainly would say to the member I have uh, considerable concerns um, ar ar around funding, and there is a number of pressures out there of which welfare reform uh, and the failure to date to, to uh, come to terms with that is, 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 the, is the major one. Um, that will have implications for uh, what we are doing in terms of, of skills, uh, and as the House knows, uh, investment in skills is perhaps the key economic driver of the transformation of the economy in Northern Ireland. To date, we have sought to act in a strategic way. Uh, and uh, to avoid uh, hitting areas that are of real crucial importance to the transformation of the economy, such as uh, apprenticeships. We also have support from the European uh, Social Fund in, in this regard. How long we can sustain that, uh, uh, particularly in the context where the cuts become even deeper, whether this year or in, in subsequent years, uh, r remains uh, to be seen. Uh, but we will seek to, to act uh, responsibly uh, in that regard. What I do fear is that in particular, as Northern Ireland uh, is emerging uh, from a, a very a deep uh, recession, when we have a lot of international uh, goodwill, when we have the potential to bring in inward investment to in Northern Ireland, when we have the potential to grow jobs locally, due to cuts to key economic drivers, whether in my department or elsewhere, that we simply fail to capitalise upon uh, those opportunities. And there is a real danger here that we are going to collectively shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot and, and miss an absolutely open goal that is out there for us in terms of, of future investment and job creation. 
Colin Minister Danny Kenahan. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister and it's, uh, for his answers. And it's good to see apprenticeships getting such a high um, profile. But could the Minister explain what due diligence checks his department takes to ensure that anybody offering apprenticeships has the necessary ability and accreditation to deliver for students? I yeah, thank the member for, for the question. And, and again, as the, the member uh, refers to the apprenticeship strategy, he will see that quality assurance is something that's absolutely fundamental uh, to the approach uh, that, that we are taking. Uh, and that applies to, in particular, around the, the whole qualifications network and the, 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 uh, the off the job training uh, that is uh, provided. Um, I am very sensitive to the issue that we're not chasing numbers and trying to badge something as an apprenticeship for the sake of it. This has to be driven by quality and that both young people and businesses need to respond uh, based upon quality and have that assurance that they're investing in something that actually is credible. So there's no shortcuts in this and we have to ensure that what uh, we uh, are investing in we can stand over and that people will have, will have confidence in it. Thank you. And I call Mr Roy Beggs. Question number five. Uh, the relocation from Georgetown to Belfast will see the vast majority of the activities transferred to Belfast by 2018. The exceptions will be student residences, the high performance sports centre and the fire safety engineering facility. The development in Belfast will cost at £250 million. Uh, my department is, provided, is providing £16 million, while the university has secured a £150 million loan from the European Investment Bank, as well as a financial transactions capital loan of £35 million. The remaining funding has been raised by the, by the University from a variety of sources. Good progress has been made with the development across many fronts, and the University remains confident that the project will be delivered on time and within budget. The demolition phase was completed on schedule, and the physical structure of the new uh, University buildings are beginning to emerge. The University is finalising the procurement process to appoint a contractor to, to construct the main campus building. The University is engaging with the local community in the vicinity of the new campus to ensure that they are involved in a meaningful way, so that the new campus will provide real and tangible benefits for the local area. The Department is working closely with all stakeholders through inclusive implementation structures to ensure a coordinated approach to the relocation and to maximise the opportunities arising from the development. I call Mr Beggs for a supplementary. The loss of uh, university courses at the Jordanstown site will result in a loss of jobs in terms of lecturers and also the wide range of the support staffs in, in the Jordanstown area. So can the Minister advise what action he is taking to encourage the university to develop alternative job opportunities at that site and in specifically in his answer he, I didn't hear him mention a uh, business incubation unit uh, where there has been spin out companies in the past, a, an excellent site for such high tech companies either in that site or in the adjacent or neighbouring uh, Trooperstown Lane site, both of which are shortly to be upgraded in terms of their uh, communication links with Belfast and the A2 upgrade. <laughs> Well, I, I'm happy to reflect upon the comments uh, made and also to, to pass those on uh, to the university uh, di directly to, to, to consider. In terms of, of jobs, what I would say this, this is not a, a, a reduction in terms of provision. This is a relocation uh, of the, the vast majority of the Jordanstown campus uh, to, to Belfast. Uh, it's an investment uh, for the future. Um, that said, I mean, obviously universities are in a very difficult uh, situation at present. Um, there is a, a wider funding challenge that, that predates uh, the, uh, the current uh, budget uh, situation facing the executive. But this year, I've had to pass on uh, cuts of approaching 4% uh, to the universities, and uh, that will be for them uh, to manage. So they are going to be under a, a degree of pressure in terms of maintaining existing services. And it goes without saying that whenever we're talking of cuts of that magnitude, that there will be pressures on unemployment and people need to be very uh, alert uh, to, to that. Uh, but in terms of the, of the, the future use of Jordanstown, uh, as the member has outlined, uh, we will reflect upon what he has said, and indeed I will encourage the university to do so as well. well Mr David Hildich. Thank you, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and, and as well as the, the issues of employment raised by Mr Bayes, can the Minister indicate what future does the Jordanstown campus hold in relation to higher education itself? Well, as I said in the main answer, there will be a number of, of areas that will be retained uh, on, on that site. Uh, but to, to be fair, the vast majority of, of the site is being relocated uh, to, to Belfast, and uh, that will, be, uh, will have implications, for, obviously, for, for the East Andrew area and also for, for, North, for North Belfast and the, and the wider city. Um, 
there, there's obviously a, a wider issue uh, which the member will be familiar with in terms of the, uh, the future of the site as a whole, which is a very, a very large site. And no doubt he and his colleagues will want to make representations in that regard, and that's part and parcel uh, of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the local responsibilities that MLAs and, and councillors will have. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, the ministers uh, made reference uh, to the local community. Uh, would the minister urge the university to maintain uh, a sustained and meaningful dialogue with the local community, particularly in relation to uh, uh, trying to assist the local community, not just in jobs, but also in terms of using facilities and the services of the university? Yes, I'm, I'm very happy um, to, 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 to follow the, the, uh, the, the approach suggested uh, by the member and to encourage the university to deepen uh, their existing efforts in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think what we want to avoid is a situation where we build a university uh, in, in Belfast, and in particular in North Belfast, uh, but it is one that is detached from the community. And if we look elsewhere in these islands and indeed internationally. We can see examples uh, of universities that are in cities but are detached from those cities and also examples, uh, much better examples, where they are very much integrated in, into, into local communities. Obviously, we want to see the latter happening in, term, in terms of Belfast. And I think there is still more work that can be done uh, to ensure that that, that is a, a reality. Uh, a few weeks ago, I met with a delegation of Antrim Road uh, uh, traders uh, and the, the, wider, the wider facility. They made a number of useful points that we are also uh, reflecting upon. Uh, and I think the, the university um, sh should be encouraged to continue uh, and widen their efforts in this regard particularly as they, they, they move to the, towards the completion of the site in 2018 and the, the very successful opening and commencement of, of studies in the area. Thank you. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Question number six, please. Uh, at present, the level of tuition fee loan available for local students wishing to attend courses in non-publicly funded higher education institutions or alternative providers is dependent on both the, lo the location of the provider and the nature of the course. Following the executive's decision to freeze tuition fee levels here, I have ensured that all local students attending higher education providers in Northern Ireland, whether they are publicly funded or not, are eligible to the same maximum tuition fee loan of £3,685. Alternative providers are not, however, subject to fee caps and may charge more than this amount. When the alternative provider is based elsewhere in the UK, the level of loan available is dependent on the nature of the course. Local students attending a designated course owned by a recognised UK degree awarding body but being delivered by an alternative provider are entitled to a maximum tuition fee loan of up to £9,000. Local students attending a designated course owned and delivered by an alternative provider and simply validated by a recognised UK degree awarding body are entitled to a lower rate of tuition fee loan of £3,685. This aligns with the maximum loan available to students studying in Northern Ireland. It is not uncommon, however, for, for providers to charge over and above that amount. The current student support package available to local students, including those attending alternative providers, is being considered as part of my department's re uh, review of higher education funding. We are working with, within the context of constrained public resources, and a major challenge during the course of the review will be in deciding whether or, where our funding priorities should lie in relation to student support. A public consultation on the review will commence towards the end of this year. Gray for supplementary. The Minister may be aware that the Committee for um, uh, uh, Arts and Leisure recently visited the Andrew Lloyd Webber School of Performing Arts in Chiswick to be informed that it was the premier location for such activities in the whole of the United Kingdom. Does he accept that it is a little bit unfortunate when a citizen of Northern Ireland wishes to attend such a premier institution? that he does not get the support that he would get if he was in the rest of the United Kingdom? And would the Minister undertake to have a look at that case uh, in exception? Well, f first of all, it's, it's difficult for, for me to, to make uh, exceptions because I think every case um, can, make, can make that argument and we have to, to make decisions based around a, a, an agreed uh, policy. But the case that the, the member has outlined uh, is, is not unusual and we, we do receive uh, correspondence uh, from a number uh, of MLAs and indeed directly from students uh, in, in, this, in regard to that, similar situations that, to that that has been outlined. Um, that is why we are... Um, 
considering this issue as part of the current review of higher education uh, funding. Um, whether we're going to be able to close that gap uh, remains to be seen because it will be dependent upon uh, resources. Um, we did decide back in 2011, whenever we were last looking at issues around higher education funding, uh, that it would be unfair to provide a, a higher tuition fee loan to Northern Ireland domicile students attending alternative providers than to those attending our own publicly provided providers in Northern Ireland, especially whenever we are asking those local providers to find efficiency uh, savings. That was a collective decision by, by the executive. So there is a balance to, to this argument, uh, but I, I can certainly confirm to the member that we are uh, giving it uh, full consideration and open to uh, a, a change in policy. And that brings us to the end of the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister to give us an update on the progress of the Performing Arts and Techni Technology Innovation Centre at Zurich and Bangor? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, good progress is, is being made, and uh, uh, with luck uh, and uh, with no uh, unexpected delays emerging over the, the coming months, uh, we would look forward um, to construction uh, being completed um, by uh, next summer, and uh, hopefully the facility will be open uh, and available to students and also crucially to the, to the public in terms of performing arts uh, in the autumn of 2015. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister give us an assurance on the long-term sustainability of the project? And um, is he confident that it will provide a much-needed theatre facility for North Down? Um, well, in terms of the, of the uh, sustainability, it will be dependent upon um, resource funding uh, coming uh, through uh, my, my department. Um, that obviously is going to be under increased pressure over the coming years. Uh, that said, I mean, this is a, a new investment, and we will want to make sure that it is a, a success in that regard. Uh, we would obviously encourage uh, the college uh, to make as much public use of the facility as, as they can, and in doing so, it, it can become a, a theatre uh, and performing arts space uh, for the wider community uh, in Bangor and, and elsewhere in North Down. And I can certainly assure the member that what is being constructed here is a full spec uh, theatre. Um, it, it will have all of the facilities that one would expect to see in that, in that type uh, of, of environment. This has obviously been driven uh, to provide a, a, a real-time experience for students in terms of the whole range uh, of skills in, involved in the performing arts, whether they're actually on stage through to backstage activities and uh, the various uh, uh, digital and, and, and media support. So uh, that full range of activities is going to be provided and that we want to have the, uh, a world-class facility to enable the students to, to learn in that type of environment. And obviously the, the, the local community will benefit from that. And I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, could he give us a progress um, uh, report on the Spiceless uh, Welding Academy that he set up recently? Yes, um, thank the member for his, his interest in this issue, and uh, alongside my colleague uh, Chris Little, um, the member has been uh, very vocal uh, in encouraging the department uh, to, go, to go down uh, th this route. Um, th it is something where we have responded to um, the, the concerns uh, to ensure that we are facilitating opportunities um, uh, at a much greater level uh, for, uh, for people who have some welding skills but have not. In, in recent times, been able to access employment uh, due to the need for very uh, specialist uh, type uh, qu qualifications. Um, the, the, the advertisement for the current, uh, for the first cohort of people going through that, has, has now closed, and selections are, are, are underway. And, uh, and uh, I hope that that course will be completed within perhaps a 68-week window, and that people graduating from that will then be eligible to work uh, on, on projects coming through uh, Hard and Wolf. Douglas, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for his, his answers to date and also um, for his leap of faith in supporting this initiative. But could I ask the Minister, would he agree with me that there is a potential for more oil rigs to come into Harnwolf? And so it's vitally important that we train up those unemployed people in particular. Well, I absolutely concur with that. Um, the member will be aware that uh, indeed there, there's some uh, advertisements are ready for a project that Harlan Wilf are conducting uh, right at this at this time. So there's real life evidence in that regard. That has come perhaps a little bit too quick 
to, uh, to, to, to allow people going through the academy to avail of those opportunities. Uh, but through discussions from my officials with Hard and Wolf, um, we are very encouraged by the, the long-term prospects in, in this area. Uh, the member will be familiar with the oil rig that was in um, uh, during the first uh, half of this year. Um, my understanding is that the, 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 uh, the customers were extremely pleased by the quality of workmanship uh, in, in that regard, uh, and that has really uh, placed the, the, the uh, Harlan Wilth in, in a good place uh, for future work. Thank you. And I call Mr Ian Mill. I got that pretty blessed one, Collier. Can I ask the Minister uh, for his assessment of Mikva's recent report on Olive and Wade? Well, I I think it's, it's important that we approach the issue uh, of the living wage uh, with a, a degree uh, of caution. Um, first of all, I would want to encourage uh, employers to consider uh, the, the living wage, and it's important that uh, people are, 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 paid, are paid well. I think where we need to be slightly cautious is where we would go for a degree of compulsion for employers uh, to pay a, a living wage. Uh, the, the, f the first thing we have to do is to recognise that the best way of driving up uh, wages in, in this society is through investment in skills, and on the, co on the back of that we will have a productivity gain, and rising from that you have a natural rise in terms of, of wages. Obviously, we have the national minimum wage. That's something that's guided by the Low Pay uh, Commission, and I do believe that there is a case uh, for an increase in, in that regard. However, if you end up setting a, a threshold of, of, of wages that is in way in excess of what is viewed as being the natural market rate, there may well be a danger in terms of un unemployment or indeed an, in an increase in the prices that are uh, charged in, ter in terms of whether it's a shop or, or other businesses for their goods, uh, facilities and services, which then has a knock-on consequence elsewhere uh, with within the economy. Uh, also, we have a number of job employment programmes where we're trying to get people off unemployment and into work. We often offer sub subsidies to employers uh, to, take people, to take people on. Uh, that is, is a reflection that often, particularly for small businesses, these are decisions that are made uh, on, on the margins. And if we are to, to shift the goalposts in that regard, uh, a lot of employers will, will be more reluctant to take a chance on taking on an extra person uh, and uh, addressing uh, our, our situation with, with unemployment, where we are making some very, very good progress uh, at the moment. So while I have, have sympathy with the concept, I think it's something that's best approached in a voluntary way. And I think we, if we want to go down the, the line of compulsion, I think I think we need to be very alert to the unintended consequences. For a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, in light of what you've said, uh, would you consider legislative change? I take it from your answer that you wouldn't, <laughs> as part of the forthcoming bill um, on employment law. Well, the issue itself is probably not something within my powers, indeed it's not something within the powers of the, of the Assembly um, itself. Um, we may have a discussion uh, in the coming months, uh, depending on what happens on, on Thursday, around uh, further devolution of powers or, or not, as the, as the case may be, and that, that may well be something that will we'll enter in, into that debate. Um, I think um, before we legislate, I think we need to, to be fully alert to the, uh, the full economic picture around this, and uh, I've outlined some of my concerns at, to, to the member. I think, short of legislation, we can encourage employers uh, to, to invest in the, the payment uh, of, of their workers, um, and uh, the, the, there can be benefits to the economy where, where that is done uh, in, in, in a way that is, uh, is sustainable. And uh, I think. The member should take some comfort from the fact, if you look, if you look at a lot of the jobs that we have created um, and announced in, in the past number of months, increasingly they are paying higher and higher uh, salary levels, and that is an indication that we are moving in the right direction as an economy. And, uh, question four has been withdrawn within the agreed time limit, so I, we move on. And I call Mr Barry McElduff. Uh, can I ask the minister how closely? Does his department work with and communicate with education and library boards regarding student finance arrangements to ensure that everyone is on the same page of understanding regarding regulations? Uh, well, I, I would say that at the risk of being contradicted by the member in a, in a few minutes' time, I would say that uh, we, we work uh, very closely uh, with the education and library boards uh, in this regard. Um, now, that is not to say that um, work can be done to make guidance and, and uh, forms uh, simpler, and uh, we are certainly happy to take representations, which I suspect the member is about to make in a moment, uh, as to how things can be done better. 
your opportunity, Mr. McGovern. <laughs> I hope you're all keeping well. Can I ask the Minister to clarify one particular area, and if not now, in writing later? Uh, it's an area causing uncertainty. It's students undertaking second degrees in courses which relate to allied health professional courses. Um, there seems to be a different take at Dell, within Dell, uh, and a different take within, for example, the Western Education Library Board regarding the entitlement of students uh, to avail of student finance in second degrees relating to NHS or allied health professional courses. Just invite the Minister to comment on that and to explore that. Yeah. Uh, I should have invited him with a question. <laughs> It's a very cunning approach he's adopting to it all. Um, can I say that um, there's, there's, there has been a, no, a number of cases uh, in this regard that have been brought uh, to, to my attention. Now, the particular issue that is arising here is around uh, an issue of double funding, where because we have a limited amount of money available uh, for um, investment in, in higher education, uh, our preference is to invest for, for one time in, in students accessing higher education. Sometimes that may well be a year where, uh, for somebody which then leaves them in eligibility for two or three years, depending upon uh, the nature of the course they're, they're applying to next. Um, uh, however, sometimes people where they've done a previous higher education uh, qualification uh, don't understand why they're not getting full access to funding for the full duration of another higher, edu higher education course. It is something, again, that we are looking at it within the context of the higher education funding review, because sometimes uh, there can't be anomalies in, in that system and cases where someone really is investing in, in upskilling and that there is, there is a case for a given, given full support. That will, will obviously be governed by the, the uh, availability of resources, uh, but certainly we're, we are very much aware of the, the cases that the, the member is, is uh, referring to. Thank you. And I call Mr Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I could I ask the Minister for his assessment of the challenges facing our young people who have been unemployed for over a year? Um, yes, uh, the member is very right to highlight the, the challenges facing uh, young people. Um, but thankfully, our youth unemployment uh, is falling. Um, but like many other parts uh, of, of Europe, it, it is a major challenge. And it is worth emphasising that uh, within the context of Northern Ireland, unemployment uh, is, is, is very heavily concentrated amongst, amongst young people. Uh, almost a third uh, of those people who are out of work um, are fall within that very narrow range between 18 and 24. So there's a real uh, concentration, uh, even a, a, a more disproportionate concentration than in many other societies. That um, highlights the importance of investment in, in uh, work experience uh, to enable people to get on the first rung of the ladder. It also reinforces the, the importance of good uh, careers advice. Uh, it also reinforces the importance of investment in a new form of youth training and also what we're doing around uh, apprenticeships. So those are some of the structural changes that we're making within our economy uh, to try to address uh, youth unemployment. To, to address the situation as we find it today, we have the, the Youth Employment Scheme, uh, which has been very successful in giving young people uh, opportunities. And as part of the more mainstream uh, employment programmes, uh, the former Steps to Work and now Steps to Success, there will also be support for young people uh, to avail uh, of opportunities uh, to, to get themselves into employment. Mr. Boylan, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister for his answer, but could I ask the Minister, in light of what he said, what discussions has he had with our newly elected and re-elected MEPs to look towards Europe about bringing in programmes and support to, to assist our young people in attaining employment? Um, well, we are very happy to have ongoing discussions um, with uh, the, the European uh, Union, and obviously the MEPs are uh, a very useful uh, conduit in that regard. Uh, already we have access to uh, the European uh, Social Fund. Uh, that's set to be a bigger pot for Northern Ireland uh, over the next uh, seven years than has been the case uh, previously. So that will create a lot of opportunities for us. Um, the member may also be uh, re referring to the, the Youth Employment Initiative. Uh, and due to the way internal boundaries are drawn in, uh, for Northern Ireland in terms of what are called NUTS areas, and uh, maybe NUTS is an appropriate term to, to refer to them, but uh, it's a French acronym, um, which I, I won't bore you with. Um, the, uh, 
none of our sub-regional sub areas in Northern Ireland were going to be eligible to access uh, that, that fund, uh, and we did look at a whole range of different scenarios as to how we could draw it, draw it down. But we do have access to resources domestically and also through the European Social Fund, which do allow us to offer a whole range of programmes. Obviously, we need to be mindful of coming budget pressures in that regard, uh, but it is something that I do believe should be a priority uh, for me, and I know it is for the Assembly as well. Okay, and I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Conscious you may not get the supplementary, so it's in relation to the North West College and the McConnell report. Can I ask the Minister you know, for his assessment of the, the implementation of the report to date and what steps he's taken in the, in the future to, to monitor it along with the committee? Yeah, um, thanks, Member, for the question. Obviously, um, the, McConnell, the McConnell report um, does give the opportunity for a new start uh, within uh, the, the college. Uh, we've also seen uh, a new principal uh, appointed, and also I have appointed a new chair uh, of, of the board of governors. Um, I do believe that. Pro strong progress has been made uh, across uh, the vast majority uh, of, of, the of the recommendations and that uh, the, the College are very much seized uh, of uh, the delivery in that regard. It is something that the Department is keeping a very close watch on. Uh, the Committee in the past has had a very close interest in this issue uh, as well. Um, th there will always be bumps along the road and, uh, and, and tensions between the different stakeholders, uh, but we will seek to, uh, to, uh, to be of assistance where we can uh, to overcome those and to ensure that we can invest in the college, which is a key delivery partner in terms of the skills, skills agenda in the North West. That has not always been the case. And as we look to particularly investing in Level 2, Level 3 areas, the investment in, in STEM and much greater er numbers, how we can develop a strategy for economic activity in the, in the North West. The college is a particularly important actor in that regard, so it's, it's important that we have a college that's fit for purpose and that where we have good industrial relations. And uh, that's the end of time for question time. We must uh, now move.